Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us today. We are the Hopening, the place where hope is happening. And we are here today at episode 35. And I'm here with my lovely host, Fran. Fran is a rapid transformational practitioner as well as a teacher. She teaches elementary school age children and she has been teaching for 34 years. So Fran is an absolute wealth of knowledge and experience and such a deep love for people and children in, in particular to have with us. And um, she's up in Northern Alberta, um, Canada. Uh, my name is Marina and I am a full-time rapid trans transformational practitioner and um, clinical hypnotherapist. And I am in Calgary, Alberta. I am also a part-time singer. So singing kind of keeps me grounded. And then um, we are here today with a very, very special guest. And before we go there, I want to remind you that you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just click the button, subscribe, and you will be notified every time we put up a new video. We are so grateful for the growth we've seen in the last year. So Fran, over to you to introduce our guest today. Yes, my friend Stacy Danford is here, Marina, and I have wanted Stacy on our show for so long because she speaks our language, right? Stacy is a one of the kind, and you will learn this as you listen to this interview. She's a mix of joy and neuroscience, beauty and brains. We've got it <laughs> with a master's degree in mind and brain science. She is a TEDx speaker and has been a gratitude consultant with the ABC News Show. Good morning, Texas. Stacy has 25 years of teaching and communication experience. She was voted as Fort Worth's Magazine's Best of Up and Coming Businesses of 2022 and Voyage Dallas Magazine's Most Inspiring People. She is the owner and operator of The Grateful Brain. A consulting company that uses neuroscience to help individuals, schools, and companies understand that your brain power is your superpower, but only if you use it and know how to use it. Stacy and her husband, Larry, live in Azil, Texas, and are proud parents to three incredible children, Brent, who is 32, Brooklyn, who is 29, and Brady, 14. <laughs> and she has a grandbaby, Marina, just like you, one years old. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> one years old. So her motto, turn the life you have into the life you want. And so I got to know Stacy when I took her course called Chemical Soup. Yes. And I still use her, her course in my classroom. And I met Stacy at the beginning of the pandemic which was the absolute perfect time to learn about gratitude. And I use her information every day in my classroom for my students. And it turns gratitude into happiness. And uh, so I'm just so grateful to have you here, Stacey. Thank oh, you. thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I was like, wow, I feel so important when you said all that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So tell us your background, Stacey. You've got this incredible background that kind of mirrors Marina and mine, uh, which, you know, it created experts in us through our weaknesses became our strengths. Yes, absolutely. And I, I can tell you for sure, I always own up to all my mistakes. And I said, I'm the girl who's made a million mistakes, but I'm living proof that you can move past them. And I think so many times, especially people in middle age, think it's too late to start over and they just figure they are what they are. And I hear people say that almost every day. Well, that's just who I am. And really, you can be anybody you want to be if you want to be it. And the problem in society is people want you to change. Your spouse wants you to change. Your mom wants you to change. Your boss wants you to change. That never works and it never will. So if anybody out there is trying to change anybody, stop right now, because you cannot change someone else's brain. You can make them be afraid of you and they'll do something or you can punish them and they'll do something or they might do it to get a reward. 
but it is not changing their brain and their brain will always go back to their own behavior. And so the really the only way that anyone ever changes is intrinsically if they want to do it themselves. Extrinsic motivation works short term. But if the person doesn't see the benefits, they'll always go back to their old behavior. And that sounds so familiar in the work that we do as well, Stacey. And um, it was fascinating because I had to research you. Um, it, like Fran, I did not do your course, but I was so, so inspired just listening to some of your videos, your TED Talk, and then reading your, your, your story on your website. So there was that big turning point in your life. So why don't you tell us what brought you to where you are today? Absolutely. Well, I would say two things for sure, but one of them that, that got me into researching gratitude was the worst student I ever taught in my whole entire life. He was terrible. He was awful, awful. He was 16 fresh out of military school, chip on his shoulder, mad at the world. And I had him in art humanities class, you know, and I'm trying to talk to him about art history and the beauty of the world. And he was like, lady, he wouldn't have in any part of it. And he was awful. And I had never had a student that I couldn't reach. And I always loved my kids. They loved my class. It was very respectful until this kid came. And my daughter, who was a senior at the time, I asked her and I was like, oh, my gosh, what do I do with this kid? He's awful. And she said, mom, what do you know about him? And I said, what do you mean? What do I know about him? And she said, what do you know? And I said, well, I know he's terrible. That's what I know. And she said, exactly. You know nothing. And she said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I was like, Wow, such wisdom from an 18 year old. And she said, none of us care about our classes unless we think the teacher cares about us. And she said, tell him something nice. And I was like, I don't even know anything nice. He's so terrible. And the very next day I was like, okay, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to say one nice thing to him every single day and see if it makes a difference. Well, of course, you know, as per usual, the day I decided to start, he was the worst he'd ever been. He was awful. And I was teaching at a private school where behavior just wasn't really an issue. And he was awful. And he, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. This is terrible. And I could just hear her voice in the back of my head. And the only thing I could think of was I told him, I said, Andrew, I love the way you part your hair. <laughs> <laughs> and this 16 year old kid looked at me like what is wrong with you lady and that was all that was all I could think of and so you know of course it didn't work the next day he comes back terrible again and I just kept trying to think of something one thing every day and that's what I'm working on in my new book is find one good thing and it all starts with one good thing well the year you know went on about three weeks later I noticed he wasn't good, but he wasn't terrible. And six weeks later, he walked into my class and he said, hey, Miss D, what's up? And I was like, oh my gosh, look what is happening right now? But it took six weeks of consistently every single day. Well, he ended up being one of my very best students at the end of the year, but he was terrible in everybody else's class. Awful. He ended up, you know, having to leave our school and, but I kept in contact with him always. And I would send messages, you know, I would tell the kids, tell Andrew, I'm thinking about him. I'm sending him some happy today. Well, he ended up going to rehab. He had, you know, went through a roller coaster of life, but he always kept in contact with me. Well, one day he wrote me and he said, Miss Stanford, I'm going to be in town. Do you want to go have coffee? And I said, oh my gosh, I would love to. So we were sitting there having coffee and I asked him, I said, Andrew, what made your behavior in my class so different than it was in all the other classes. And he said, Miss Danford, you smiled at me every time you saw me and you made me feel like you were grateful I was alive. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh. Like, and that was the first time I'd ever heard the word grateful in that context. 
it had always been, you know, when you get a gift or you're grateful for your family or your house. But somebody told me my actions made them think I was grateful they were alive. And I I was really baffled by that. I was like, that doesn't really make any sense. That's not what gratitude is. I thought gratitude was saying thank you and, you know, having good manners. And so I went home that day and I started researching about smiling and about gratitude and found out there was science in both of those categories. And I was like, wow, what I thought was gratitude is actually good manners. And it's so much deeper and it activates your brain. No wonder it changed his brain. And so I decided that I wanted to learn more about what the brain was doing and how real scientific gratitude is different than, you know, just what we think gratitude is. And to this very day, that's been many, many years ago, Andrew works for me now and I still talk to him every single week. Absolutely phenomenal story. (laughs) Wow. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. He and and we always matter of fact, I have his painting hanging on my wall. I keep it hanging there as a reminder that one thing consistently can change somebody's life. And it doesn't have to be, we think things have to be big or they have to be really important. And it doesn't. I started off telling that poor child I like how he parted his hair. that's how you know it all began but he tells me all the time he said Miss Stanford you changed my life and I said oh honey you changed mine and but that's what scientific gratitude does it is the only thing that we know is beneficial for both the giver and the receiver it activates the brain of both it's a reciprocal process and it is in my opinion the the biggest game changer out there yeah, it's wow. pretty. It, it's a powerful thing. Okay, and then my second reason that got me into really going back to school is on my 49th birthday, I declared to a room full of people, this was going to be the best year of my life. I was actually excited to turn 49. And I was going to do one really fun thing every single month of my 49th birthday so that when I turned 50, I was going to say, you know, I've done 12 awesome things. I'm so I'm rolling into 50 with my skates on fire. Well, two weeks later, my husband left me and I was devastated. I'd never saw it coming. We didn't have a fight. He told me he loved me that morning. We'd gone to my son's basketball game and I was just blindsided. And I remember I cried for about a week. I took off a week of school. I just, I couldn't even function. And I was sitting in the bathroom floor, just crying, thinking my life was over. And I happened to get a glimpse of my own face in the mirror. And I was, you know, ugly crying for sure. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, look at you. Look at you. You left your value in the hands of someone else and they walked out with it and you have none left. Get up girl. And I literally said it out loud. Get up girl. You're starting over and you're going to own your own value. And you've got to like who you are because you let someone else tell you your worth and they just left. And so I had always, I'd been studying gratitude and smiling all this time. And I was like, you know what? I'm going back to school. I'm going to get a degree in this and I'm going to tell everybody what this is and that they can have their own bathroom floor moment. But when you tell your brain you like you, it changes everything. And here I am today. I say the happiest person in the world. I like myself better (laughs) than anybody in the world. And You know, I get flack for that a lot, which is funny. People say, I can't believe you say you like yourself. And isn't that kind of conceited? And I'm like, oh, no. And I said, because I know what it feels like when I don't. And I would much rather love myself because I go with me everywhere I go. And if I don't like me, guess what? There I am. And I was like, I'm my own best friend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love what you said in your TED talk about only 10% of um, our lives is the reality that we perceive out there. Yes. And that it, really made me think. I know. And we think it's... It, it, that life determines our happiness, but it's, that's actually not true. And science does not back that up. In fact, it, it backs up the exact opposite. 
that 50% of our happiness is actually genetic, our set point from what we learned through life and our parents and the examples we were taught, then 10% of it is from our outside circumstances. So like your husband leaving you, you lost your job, whatever. But 40% of it is absolutely up to you in your mindset and what you are thinking, what you're saying. And I tell people all the time, like your brain is listening. You're not tricking yourself. And just because the words don't come out doesn't mean that your brain doesn't know what you're thinking. And, you know, when I was a kid, I remember watching Bambi, which I always say was the worst movie of all time because it taught us if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And so we think if we don't say it, then there's no harm. But that is not true. You think it and your brain knows you thought it. And if you don't like you, you think you're fat, ugly, you know, you're not smart enough, you're not good enough, you're not tall enough. Your brain knows and it's building its identity. And I call it identity theft. And I was like, it it steals who you could be and who you are because of the silent thoughts inside your own head. You know, Stacy, you have a quote, what fires together, wires together. Yeah. And um, it, can you explain that a little bit? I explain it to my students in a way that they can understand it. But, uh, you know, with your neuroscience background, you can really, uh, you know, you, you can tell our audience really about the science of firing together, wiring together. That is the, it's called Hebb's law and it's the basic principle of all of neuroscience, neurons that fire together, wire together. So every time you think, speak, you know, use any of your senses, movement, anything, neurons are firing. And when they fire together, they create a wiring system or what we call a pattern. And those patterns are what make your brain work. And we've got lots and lots of patterns that we use, you know, over and over again. And our brains are lazy. And that's sad to say, but it's true. And your brain doesn't want to use a new pattern. You have to force it to use an, a new pattern. So let's say you have a pattern that is silent in your head. And it's something that you thought, you know, I'm not smart at math or oh my gosh, nobody, I'll never get hired for that job. I don't have the right credentials, whatever the pattern is. So anytime your brain is triggered, it follows a pattern. And before you even know it, the pattern has been fired. That's how habits are created. That's why people, when they're nervous, they reach for chips or alcohol or drugs or whatever it is, because your brain is always looking to move out of discomfort. How can I get out of this uncomfortable situation? Well, it doesn't know good or bad. It doesn't know what's going to be beneficial for you in the end. It only knows patterns. And it thinks if you use a pattern over and over and over, apparently you must like it because you're following that pattern every single day. So think of it like a road. And, you know, most of us take the same road to work every day. That's the quickest way there. And, you know, sometimes you catch yourself, you're just driving there, you know, by yourself. That's the same way your brain works. It works. It follows the path over and over. Well, there are a million other ways you could get to work, but you just take this one every single day. So that's exactly how your brain's working. And especially little children and elementary teenagers, they're building those patterns. They're getting strong and tight. So if you walk into math class every day and start panicking and feeling anxiety and you're thinking silently, oh my gosh, I'm not good at this. Your brain's like, oh, we're not good at this. Turn on the chemicals of anxiety, turn on the cortisol. You don't like this. You'll start sweating. You'll start getting a headache. You'll feel all the things. It's the same as when we're an adult. If we're walking into a job interview and you're like, oh, I always mess this up. And you're thinking it out loud. Oh, I should have got another degree. Oh, what if they don't like me? All of those things are patterns. But the problem is those patterns, if they're emotional, are also creating a chemical shift in your body. And the chemicals are the key to everything. And if you're feeling crummy, I can rest assured to you that you are releasing crummy chemicals. And if you are feeling lovely, you are also releasing chemicals that match that. So if you want to know what your chemicals are doing, just think about how you're feeling. If you're feeling really peaceful, 
your brain chemicals are releasing a very peaceful state, which is why hypnosis, meditation, relaxation, that's why those things work. They put you in a different state, which also put your chemicals in a different state. Yeah. That was a really long explanation. Sorry. <laughs> No, you do it extremely well. Love, so that's beautiful. I love the science, right? I mean, I'm uh, I'm in this job. I'm, you know, I've been a teacher for as long as I have been, um, and I'm I'm doing hypnotherapy now and Marina as well because we care about people, right? We care, and uh, so just simple little tricks, the little tricks where we can you know, I don't know, maybe it's the conscious part of our brain tricking the subconscious part back, you know, to create the neuroplasticity that we need to create new pathways. Yes. And um, so I know, Stacy, that you taught me a lot of little tricks that I could use, not just for myself, but for with my students. And um, it's really brilliant. Like your stuff is brilliant. Because I can take, you know, the, that first year of pandemic and we all came back into the classroom wearing masks, right? Yes. And we had been out of school for five months, right? No school for five months. And so it was, it was scary for the kids. It was very scary for many teachers. And um, I used your stuff and it changed my classrooms the dynamics of the classroom was incredible and you know how energy works right uh -huh. if i'm excited i'm happy i'm not worried right because gratitude helps you with that worry mm -hmm. uh, i don't know i just call it like a virus in itself worry is like a virus and it catches and it catches and it catches so if you can create an environment of energy that's gratitude because gratitude creates happiness and yes. happiness pushes out worry. Like, can you give us some of those tips um, yes. just off the top of your head? Yes. Um, if you think about the, the letters M M H H G G that that's kind of how I follow the deal. So the M there's two M's music and movement. Mm -hmm. And then H H is um, the happy list and humor and then GG is goals and gratitude. So those six things are what I call the chemical shifters. But music I use every day all the time. And it is the one of the fastest, I think, ways to activate chemicals in your brain. But the problem is when you're feeling crummy, worried, upset, nervous, sad, your, your brain will fight against you. Because most of us just sit in it and we just think about what we should have said. And I'm so mad at her. And oh my gosh, I'm terrible at this. And your brain actually wants to finish the pattern. It wants to stay in that cycle. Think about it like a hamster on a wheel. You know, they just keep going around and around and around. Eventually you have to get off. <clears throat> but your brain, it will fight you. And that's the difference is being intentional versus automatic. Because your automatic processes will take you to where you always go. It'll follow the road it always takes. Intentionality moves you to a place of difference. So if you want positivity, if you want happiness, change, gratitude, it will do. You have to be intentional because your brain is not wired to stay happy. It's not wired to keep you happy. Happiness is not wired to go to long-term memory. It stays in short-term, but trauma and danger and fear, those go over to long-term. And your brain is made to keep you alive. It'll breathe without you. It'll digest your food. It does all those things. It's made to be an automatic functioning machine. But it, the people who have really joyful, successful lives have learned to move their brain to intentionality. So when you're feeling sad or mad or whatever, Use music and it takes 30 seconds, just like my TED Talk says, 30 seconds a day can change your life. And but the problem is some people play music that they like, you know, or they like classical music. Well, that's wonderful if you're wanting to calm down. But if you're wanting to change your emotions and go from sad to happy or feel excited or energetic, that is not going to get you there. <laughs> you have to have music that has a beat high enough frequency that makes you want to bounce and whatever music it is heavy metal 
is not going to get you there either. That's going to push you too far into agitation. So something that you like, it could be jazz, it could be reggae, it could be whatever. But if you feel that need to bounce a little, then you know you're activating that area of your brain. It'll switch over your chemicals. Movement is the other M, super fast way, which is very sad in lots of schools that they're taking out recess, they're taking out PE. Movement is one of the best things you can do for your brain. There's boatloads of research about it. I don't know why they do that. It drives me crazy. But people think, you know, you got to be a CrossFitter or whatever to <clears throat> get the benefits of movement. And that's not true. It's about five to 10 minutes. Just get up and move because you're using a whole different section of your brain to activate those muscles. Well, when you move the blood flow to that section, it releases it from the emotional section and it gets out of that frenzy. So, you know, Fran, I'm an avid hula hooper and I love to hula hoop. <clears throat> I think people think I'm crazy all the time, but it activates right hemisphere, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, left hemisphere. It's one of the things that really fires up all of your brain at one time, but it doesn't matter what you do. If you walk, if you jump and jack, I have tap shoes in my garage. I tap dance also. I have pom poms. I do. I do all kind of stuff and because roller I, and roller skate. I love to skate. But my brain is my job. My joy is my job. It's not my kid's job to make me happy. It's not my husband's job. It's not my yard's job. My job is to make me happy, and I have to be intentional to do it. Then the H humor. So easy. I have a whole playlist on my phone of funny videos. It doesn't matter if it's a cat or whatever it is. If you laugh, you just dumped out endorphins. Endorphins are a chemical component that blocks pain. Of course, you're going to feel better. Keep laughing until you do. Keep scrolling. That's why TikTok has become so popular during the pandemic. In the pandemic, we were feeling pain, anxiety, worry, fear. What did TikTok do? We watched people dance. We watched funny stuff. And they're 15 seconds long. Our brain was firing in 15 second intervals. Of course, it's going to make you happy. No wonder it became a blockbuster boom. Um, then a happy list is the other H. Every person out there, in my opinion, should have five things they know make them happy always. And it cannot depend on anyone else. That's the caveat. So I know cold chocolate always makes me happy. I always have those little tiny Rolos and I, they're in my refrigerator. If food is your issue. Well, you know, don't pick that. It's not my issue. So that works for me. I also love to ride with the windows down. Even in the winter, I turn the heater on high and I leave the windows open. Something about driving down a dirt road in Texas with the windows down always cheers me up. I love a bubble bath. I love the smell of a vanilla tobacco candle. <laughs> yeah, I love coffee in my mug that I can get all four fingers through. Those things always make me happy, but it's my job to go get them and go do that when I am upset instead of just sitting in it and wallowing in it and calling my friend and telling her about it. And, you know, it, it, we just ruminate and reactivate the pattern with every person we tell. So every time we reactivate the pattern, our brain thinks we repeat it. You must like it. Oh, she told 12 people that same crappy story today. Oh, she must really want that pattern to stay activated. And, you know, they used to say venting, just vent it, just get it out. That, that neuroscience does not back that up at all. And, you know, if you want to have one person or, you know, two maybe that are your like confidant and say, I'm going to tell you this, I don't want you to like be on my team. I don't want you to keep to, I just want to tell somebody because this hurts me and this is upsetting. That's good. That, that is beneficial. But if you're only telling people so they can get mad with you or they can join you and, oh, none of us like math. Oh yeah. We don't like the teacher. Oh yeah. We don't like the president. Look, if you're mm -hmm. only telling people to get them on your team, all of you are activating a pattern and it's called brain to brain synchrony and brains will actually hook up and you'll join people. Why do you think, especially here in the United States, like all the political debates, 
people love to get somebody on their team and then they hate the people on the other side. It was brain to brain synchrony. You were in a chemical pattern with other people and it became kind of a frenzy. That's what riots are. That's what all of, they're just a chemical frenzy when people's brains sync up for a specific thing. In this case, it was anger. So when you know the things on your happy list and every kid should have it too, you know, and like I used to have students that just needed to stand up. And I know there are teachers out there who don't like that, but I was like, you know what, if standing up gets your brain reactivated, like knock yourself out, stand up. I don't care because kids know, they know, they know, do I need to doodle? Can I draw on the edge of my paper? You know, when I feel worried, can I just get it out with a little doodle on the edge? you know how your brain works. The problem is people want your brain to work like my brain. And this works for me. I want you to do this. Every brain is different and they're as different as our thumbprints. There are no two brains alike in all the world, even identical twins. There is a 70 trillion percent chance that they might have the exact same DNA. It identical twins, 70 trillion. So imagine us, you know, like our brains are completely unique depending on your life experiences and what's happened. They fire differently. So I tell my 14 year old, God love him. Sometimes what he wants to do to make himself feel better is not what works for me. <laughs> and I'm wanting to talk about it. And he's like, mom, you said when I'm mad that you would give me a five minute break. And, you know, as parents, we want to talk about it and we want to say all the things sometimes with our spouse, you know, we want to tell them and he knows he'll say things he doesn't want to say. He's like, mom, you said you would give me a five minute timeout. And I was like, I did say that. And if that's what works for your brain, you come get me when you reach a place that you're ready to talk. It has dramatically changed our relationship. And I was like, you know, I remember when I was going through puberty, I wasn't at my very, you know, most perfect child. <laughs> and, it, you know, and he just gets frustrated about stuff. He doesn't want his room a certain way, whatever. So that is at your happy list is such a powerful tool. I honestly use it probably four or five times a day, every day when I feel my emotions shift in a direction I don't want them. It's my job to pull them back and put them in a place that feels better for me. Um, okay, then the G's are goals and gratitude. Goals are so important. And I'm not talking about your big goal. You know, I want to make a million dollars. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about little daily goals, little small things that you can mark off because your brain loves to mark things off and you get a little hit of dopamine when you do something. The problem is people sometimes make a to-do list and it's, you know, I got 30 things on it and then they feel like a loser because they didn't get the things done. I, that was me, especially ADD. I'm like, oh, I need all this, all this, all this. And I saw that it was affecting me negatively. And I was like, that's not working for me. So I call it my MIT. Every day I write an MIT, my most important thing. And if today just falls apart and everything goes awry, what is my most important thing? What's one thing I need to get done today? And sometimes it's something as small as I've got to call the doctor and reschedule my blood work. And if for some reason I put that kind of stuff off and then it you know hangs on me like a weight. And so every morning on my little calendar, I write my MIT and then I mark it off and I feel so powerful. I feel so accomplished. But what I'm teaching my brain is I can stay focused. I can do things. I can reach a goal. Well, now it's changed and I can do a lot of goals now because my brain believes in me instead of having this giant list that I never accomplish, because that's also teaching my brain. You're never going to do that. You know, you don't do that. You have ADD. You can't even stay focused. So do what works for you. But I tell my son every day on the way to school, I'm like, okay, bud, what's the one thing you want to do today that would make this an awesome day? And, you know, sometimes it's, I just want to sit in my room tonight and write a new song. And I'm like, okay, awesome. But at least you know where your, your goal is and what feels successful for your brain. And the last one is gratitude, which of course is my favorite. Um, that's what my graduate research was about is gratitude and what it does for the human brain. 
And what people think is gratitude, though, is not. And most of us, again, like I said earlier, think gratitude is saying thank you or, you know, being appreciative for your house or your life. That's really not scientific gratitude either. If you don't have an emotional reaction, you are not getting the brain benefits of gratitude. Um, so it can be something as simple as this water. By the way, I love this water. Um, I, my friend taught me about it and it's coconut. I was like, oh my gosh, it tastes like a melted ice cream cone. It's so great. But see, like when I was talking about it, I felt myself have an emotion that creates a chemical connection. Emotions create chemicals. So if you're not being grateful enough to have an emotion, you're not getting the chemical. So when you think about, I'm grateful for my family, instead of just saying that, feel it. Feel why. The why is the important part. Why are you grateful for your family? Because they're always here. They love me, whether I'm up, whether I'm down, whether I'm in sweatpants, whether I'm looking fabulous. These are my people. We've shared emotions. We've shared memories. I mean, like I feel my own face talking about it because I had an emotional connection. And I can do it with water. I can go, oh my gosh, I love the taste of melted ice cream and it's water and it only has five calories. Oh, what could be better? And I, I feel it. If you feel it, you've had the benefits of it. So the little secret recipe for gratitude is ESP. So if you think about, you know, ESP is like thinking into the future. I always think about it's your future of your brain. So E, it has to be emotional. There has to be some kind of emotional component the S is specific. Why? List as many reasons why as you can. And the data is very clear that it's better to be grateful for one thing in a huge detail than it is to make a list of 20. Because when gratitude first came out, people were making gratitude lists all the time, you know, and they're like 20 things. Oh, I don't even know 20 things. And when you feel dreadful and you hate it, you are creating those chemicals and your brain is associating that with gratitude. So list, I tell everybody, don't make a list anymore unless you love it and you're like really excited about it. But when we used to make kids make, I want to know 10 things you're grateful for every day. And the kids were like, oh, I hate this. We just created that feeling with gratitude and that became the pathway. So it's better to think of one thing and tell me why, be specific. And then the P is persistent every day do it every day. It's just like a yoga practice or a meditation practice. Consistency is the key. That's how you build neuroplasticity. It's not what you did one time. It's what you did one time every day. And, you know, just like if you went on a diet, one day of intermittent fasting doesn't mean you're going to be healthy or, you know, one day I meditated one day in 1994 I'm good. <laughs> like, you know, that doesn't work. You have to do, what do you do every day? that's what changes your brain. Those are my yeah. six best tips. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's absolutely Music. amazing. Sorry, Music. Brad. <laughs> Music, humor, happiness, great. Uh, gr nope, there's a G, there's a G. Goals, Goals. Goals. and gratitude. Yeah. Yes. M -H -H -G -G. And I do it with my students every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, oh, thank God I do that. <laughs> I'm, God, I'm doing that I'm doing that I'm doing that so I'm good it's like a confirmation that I'm doing this right oh, it's so crazy we uh Marina and I are so grateful to have you here um we know you have to run because your 14 year old has stuff he's yes stuff. he's a freshman yeah. in the varsity band and they asked him to play in the parade today and he was like you know, so he was scared, but excited. And, you know, that's a great thing too, for teenagers or any kids or adults, when you're scared and you back away, you just taught your brain. Oh, it's okay to constantly move out of discomfort. And of course, if something is hurtful, dangerous, move out. But every time we move away from discomfort, we're teaching our brain, we can't handle it. And it's, it's creating a pattern. Oh, you avoid discomfort. And so with him every day, I always ask him, you know, yeah, that is scary. What's one thing you can do to beat it? And he, you know, whatever the situation is. And so this morning he said, oh gosh, mom, what if I mess up? And he said, this is, this makes me nervous. And I said, what's one thing you can do to beat it? And he said, do it anyway. And I said, that's my man right there. 
That's amazing. So Stacy, um I I Googled you, so it was easy. Stacy the Antrip, Stacy with an I. Yes. So I know that's one way people can connect with you is to search you on on um, on internet, but give us some direct links where people can connect with you. Yes. Okay. Well, my new one is my text line and I send out little mental motivations all the time and little quick tips. I do think that's the best part of being a teacher is I can give you a quick tip because that's what works in a classroom. Um, And so the number is 817-242-6831. And you just text yes to that number and it'll add you to the text line. Um, then the second best way I would say is Instagram. That's where I probably am the most. And it's just Stacy Danford. And then on my website, you can also sign up for the gratitude newsletter. And it always is full of little easy, quick, actionable tips. And the biggest mistake is we think it has to be hard and difficult. And really it doesn't. It's just easy if you do it every day. Well, we're going to have to have you back because I still have a long list of things that I want to talk about. Yeah. So thank you again so much for being with us, Stacey. It was absolutely amazing. Thank you. And You're so welcome. And I'll be happy to come back on a Saturday Fantastic. Morning. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And so that's, that's it for us this week. And thank you so much again for joining us. We are the opening, the place where hope is happening. And remember to subscribe so that we can get notified when we are releasing our next video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Bye.